Okay. Uh, let's see. Um, um, I think uh, some of you have definitely started working on the assignment because you did catch a few uh, issues with the problems. And thank you for doing that. And uh, please uh, uh, continue doing that. Uh, and uh, that's uh, um, you know errors do creep in, and uh, especially. Uh, I'm not picking up the problem from somewhere and giving it to you directly. So, uh, but uh, 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 yeah, good. So I think it's correct now. But if you still find errors, please let me know. As you know, it's a painful way of uh, learning uh, something, but uh, most effective uh, to catch errors and uh, things like that. So, uh, how do I switch this one off? Okay, good. So. Uh, and uh, what we're going to do is uh, continue uh, uh, the discussion, but uh, then start talking about a few new things today, uh, especially related to the, uh, uh, to the real uh, heart of uh, compound semiconductors, the ability to make heterostructures uh, and uh, uh, to basically engineer uh, uh, electronic and photonic properties uh, at, the, uh, at that level uh, by uh, designing the materials uh, to give you what you uh, actually uh, would like to do with the with the semiconductor. Okay, so we'll uh, continue uh, uh, or and finish up the discussion we had started on this tight binding or the linear combination of atomic orbitals picture, and then uh, uh, move towards uh, uh, heterostructures and uh, uh, so the two major things you control in semiconductor devices are doping and you know uh, heterostructure band gaps. Those are the two things, two tricks that you play to do an incredibly wide array of uh, extremely useful things. And, uh, uh, and, and the reason I was uh, kind of starting from this atomic level picture is because both of them, uh, you know, you get the most intuitive feel for what uh, uh, they are, you know, doping and what uh, heterostructures are if we start from looking at it this way. Now, uh, uh, just as a, uh, you know, uh, we'll get to a point where we'll have to compare how good is this uh, uh, tight binding or linear combination picture uh, compared to some of the more uh, numerically, you know, intensive uh, techniques people use these days. Uh, and we'll discuss that, uh, but uh, uh, let me put it this way, uh, as uh, the, the, the models that, for example, are in your first assignment uh, give you, uh, in, a, in a way, uh, the first non-trivial uh, picture of a band structure, tell you things about band gaps, about symmetries, and things like that. But if you want to know exactly what is the exact band gap, what is the uh, exact effective mass, what are the uh, uh, you know, curvatures uh, in various parts of the EK diagram, uh, there are two ways. Uh, the, the, the most uh, accurate way, um, uh, you know, the most accurate way always is experiment if you can measure it. That's the most accurate. And uh, uh, because uh, uh, all theories are limited. So, 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 I mean, today the most accurate theory we have for nature, for physics, is quantum theory. Who knows what it is going to be tomorrow, right? I mean, these things keep changing. But when you do an experiment, you measure it. All the theories that have been discovered and those that are not discovered are in there, right? You cannot stop a theory from showing up in there in the experiment. So that's why experiment is extremely useful. And as we go along, including today, uh, I'll show you one of the kind of nice ways people have been using today to measure the entire EK diagram of semiconductors and compare it with the theory. And so we're going to do that today. Okay, so, okay, so, uh, so I think uh, just as a, I want to say that in the assignment, what I had, uh, I think I'd kind of mislabeled some of the uh, uh, lattice const what, what you call as the lattice constant, what you call as the nearest neighbor. But just as a very quick summary again of what are we doing in tight binding. Uh, typically uh, in tight binding model or this LCAO linear combination of atomic orbitals picture uh, or tight binding picture. Uh, the, uh, if you were to summarize how one calculates electronic uh, uh, band structure using this method, uh, we start from atomic level picture, say that I know the s orbital energies, p orbital energies of, of the uh, constituent atoms, gallium and arsenic or germanium or whatever that is. Uh, so I know the energy of the s, e1s, e2s and all that and I choose the outermost shell. I, I kind of neglect all the lower ones. Why? Because they're so deep in energy, right? 
uh, a kilo electron volts away, so we kind of neglect those and only choose the top, uh, the outermost shells. Right? And they're typically S and P orbitals in traditional semiconductors. But as we go along in the course, we're going to look at some of these uh, heavier elements, you know, like uh, uh, things uh, like bismuth selenide, which are these days uh, kind of back in the picture again because people are interested in them because they're topological insulators and things like that. Those are all compound semiconductors. Uh, and, and, and for uh, for them uh, and some of the heavy elements, uh, the D orbitals also start playing a role for some, as you know, S, P, D, and then F shells. So the higher shells start kind of coming in. Uh, and you can see why, because as you go down in the periodic table, you get heavier and heavier elements, and they have more and more electrons, so you go to more and more outer shells, right? So, so that's the idea. And, and so uh, many of these things that are being looked at uh, for, for uh, uh, so some non-trivial uh, properties of electronic uh, of electrons, such as uh, uh, you know topologically uh, um, or uh, uh, protected, uh, basically spin and momentum get very strongly locked. So if electron is going in one way with up spin, uh, if it scatters, it has to switch its spin if it goes back. So it cannot do that. So things like that. You know there are these uh, stuff that are uh, going on now. So we, we're going to look at that. Right now, we've been looking at primarily S and P orbitals, but this method can be extended with its limitations to higher orbitals as well, you know, Ds and Fs and all that stuff. One of the more popular semiconductors today is this 2D layered molysulfide, you know, molybdenum disulfide. Already in molysulfide, you have D orbitals. You know, molybdenum and uh, molybdenum is kind of deep down. So you have D orbitals, and uh, therefore, in its tight binding model, the matrix you write, there will be some D orbital energies as well, not just S and Ps. You know? Makes sense? I mean, so, so whenever we have outer shells, we need to consider those. Uh, and, and so, uh, uh, so, but in general, the structure, this is from your assignment, the structure of the matrix is uh, you identify your basis. Basis will, for example, here we have two atoms bases, you know, silicon or gallium arsenide, or graphene or boron nitride, two atom bases. The moment you go to something slightly different, there's, for example, another layered semiconductor uh, called gallium uh, uh, selenide. You know. so, so you might see this is group three, this is group six, three, six. How can three and six bond to give you, remember we had the rule of four, meaning you kind of sum them up. But here the bonding is slightly different. Uh, so, so you have uh, gallium bonded not just to arsenic, but actually one side of it is another gallium, and then that's bonded to a selenium, another to selenium. And then it kind of repeats, and there's a one layer or membrane of this. That's a semiconductor. So you can count now, electron counting, you do them, and you'll see that, well, yeah, this gallium is bonded to you know, uh, gallium down here, but then there are selenia, seleniums bonded to it. And then. So, so this is a... Uh, uh, for example, graphene is one atomic layer. This is four atomic layers. Okay. Molysulfide would be moly, molybdenum, and then sulfur, and sulfur. You know. So that's the repeating unit, molybdenum disulfide, MOS2. And this thing kind of, you know, there's another selenium, so there's multiple bonds, and this repeats, and it forms the whole bond. So this is the basis of molysulfide. This is the basis of gallium selenide. And the basis of uh, most... Uh, uh, you know, things we have looked at till now are, you know, A and B. So there are basically two atom bases. Silicon is crystal is silicon, silicon, gallium arsenic, gallium arsenic, and so on. So that's the basis. The number of atoms in the basis determines the 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 uh, size uh, uh, of the matrix that you're going to choose, tight binding matrix, right? the number of atoms, and how many orbitals are we considering, right? right? So that considers. So for example, here. We are looking at uh, two atom bases, and each atom comes with four orbitals, s, 1s, and 3ps. So 2 times 4 is 8, eight, eight by 8 matrix. For example, uh, uh, if we look at uh, here, uh, and let's say, again, uh, I'm, I mean, this may not be the case, but again, we are looking at a, a, a four atom basis, then you can see, uh, sorry, four orbitals per atom, then you can see here you get a 16 by 16, if this was the case, if each of them came in with four, right? You get a 16 by 16, right? So the nearest neighbors don't show up on the size of the matrix. The nearest, how many nearest neighbors are there will show up in these factors here, right? the, the hopping terms. So. Does it make sense? So, so that's just the way to look, you know, make sure that you've got the size of the matrix right, because if that's wrong, then obviously it's, it's fundamentally something problem. Okay? 
So, uh, uh, and, and a molysulfide, for example, uh, let's say we, we, we come in, a moly comes in with some D and some S and Ps. Let's say, again, we come in with four. As an example, it may not be the case for molysulfide. Let's say we're four, four, four. And then there are, uh, 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 you know, uh, if you look down at the crystal, uh, there will be a certain number of nearest neighbors. Uh, uh, again, I, I, maybe I can give it to you as a, a problem. Th this is relatively new, but people have come up with a decent basis set for molysulfide for tight binding. You know, and then you kind of calculate the whole band switch. You can calculate it and get the gaps and everything. So, uh, <clears throat> It has, uh, uh, you know, the tight binding model has some drawbacks, but uh, uh, I think its, it's uh, value is really in providing the, the intuition and, and capturing most of the symmetries of it. So is that right? Uh, is that clear? I mean, so the size of the matrix, nearest neighbors, basis, orbitals, they all kind of are in this matrix. They've gone in to produce this matrix, and we're looking at that. Yeah. Okay, so uh, now uh, what I want to say is, uh, uh, by the way, so we are... Uh, starting to uh, jump uh, to another chapter of uh, our textbook here. This is chapter 5. And uh, if you, some of you have actually looked forward, you would have seen that actually in chapter 5 it describes this stuff in great detail. So please start reading that now, it's chapter 5. Yeah. Chapter 2 was uh, in, in the book was more of a free electron picture. And what, you know, if, if you read a Rocket's book, he, what he says in, chapter five, in the beginning of chapter 5 is why as engineers would we want to go so much deep in the quantum mechanics and all that. It's kind of a valid question. Some of you may wonder about it, but some of you are like, I want to see it, right? But what he says is very interesting. This is the tight binding picture. Even if you have no background in quantum mechanics, it lets you do the whole band structure. It's kind of interesting. All you need to accept is there are these energy levels, right? And then when you bond them, there's some distortion. And then you let the matrix do the math, right? You just have the matrix, eigenvalue, and it will give you the whole band structure. So in a way, that's why it's it's useful and uh, uh, remember in the matrix what goes in are these energy eigenvalue uh, energy you know s orbital energies the p orbital energies right and then you get get these ho hopping energies sps and all that right hopping energy now uh, so uh, uh, one way the best way to find them is to do an experiment and then kind of say that well here's my separation between es and ep and then I measure it optically or something like that. That's one of the best ways. But you can also estimate them uh, based on uh, very simple arguments. Uh, you know, and you will get pretty close. It's not going to be exactly accurate, but you'll get pretty close. And, and some of those estimates are based on things like this. You know, for example, if you n have experimentally done a TEM and you measure the distance between two atoms of gallium and arsenic, you know the distance. Then you can plug in the D here if you find it's 3.1 angstrom or something like that. Plug it in, mass of electron, this, that, and then you get one of the matrix, hopping matrix elements from here. I mean, for example, you can, you can actually do that. That comes from, you know, particle in a box sort of picture. You know, particle in an electron is bound to a distance of D, you know, in some sense, and then it's scaled accordingly, and then you get these electron volts. Typically, you will get the, uh, and, and also the hopping elements, you can get it this way. Uh, this method was popularized by Walter Harrison, uh, uh, and uh, uh, he, he, he uh, uh, developed what he calls as the solid state uh, um, matrix uh, element, uh, matrix elements for the entire periodic table. So every atom, you can calculate those elements, you know, the ESs, the EPs, and all that, and, and plug them, you know, use them to calculate your band structure based on that. So, so it's kind of now, meaning, if you add molysulfide or some, you discover some new semiconductor tomorrow, you know, and then you can kind of use that technique to get a rough idea of the band structure to start with. Yeah. And the uh, again from uh, Rocket's book, the evolution of these pictures is uh, uh, we talked about you know silicon in the last class and gallium arsenide. So silicon, you start with three s states and and three uh, p states, one s orbital and three p orbitals. And uh, the idea here is they hybridize, and this is the shape of the s orbital. These are the px, py, and pz orbitals, right? They hybridize and they form this tetrahedral bonds, sp3s. Uh, remember, it's a very nice thing about a matrix like this is once you reach here, to reach here, you don't need to know sp3 bonding. You actually don't need to know. It is a linear combination of these things, right? And it's all buried inside there, but you don't need to know it if you know the other things. But obviously, when you do a TEM measurement, you will see the atoms, and you will know that, oh, oh and X-ray measurement or something, you know where the atoms are, and you realize this is the crystal structure. 
what you do need to know are the distances between atoms, right, to get into that matrix. And, and, and the output of the matrix will be, it'll give you that the chemical bonds are sp3. This is, so, so that's, that's an example. Uh, so that would be for, uh, uh, for, for diamond or, you know, silicon, uh, or, uh, for diamond or 3D. This is the 2D, you know, graphene. So sp2, 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 so there are triangles. And then, you know, they combine to make hexagons. And this is the orbital where the electron is left out, right? So, and we found the band because of that. Okay, so uh, uh, and and bonding, and then uh, uh, so so basically form the bonds, and this is how they look. The, the, you know these bonds tie together, and the evolution of the bands is is shown here. You know which which bands came from where, in some sense, right? So uh, and also the width of the bands and things like that. So, okay. Similarly for gallium arsenide, you know you have gallium s orbitals, arsenic s orbital, you know, gallium p orbital, arsenic p orbital. So the two of them now, that's the heart of the compound semiconductor, the two elements, they come in with different s and different p orbital energies, right, and then they hybridize and form this sort of bond. As you can see from this orbital picture, this is a slightly asymmetric bond. The electron clouds are kind of closer to one atom if you kind of sum them up. As a result, every compound semiconductor, every compound semiconductor is, has a partial ionic nature, meaning, you know, if you look at sodium chloride, this is rock salt that sodium has kind of completely given its electron away, chlorine has taken it, the highly electronegative, that's an ionic crystal, where each, you know, uh, so the, essentially the bond is, is extremely polar, it's like a dipole, right? But in a, the covalent solid like this, uh, this is, has a slight amount of ionicity. This is, the bond is slightly ionic. Uh, if you want to picture it, it, there'll be a dipole going from, you know, gallium to arsenic. Arsenic will be, has more electrons, gallium has less electrons. Right? So it's something slightly more negative charge, gallium is slightly more positively charged. Slightly. Not like sodium chloride, but to a degree. And later on in this class, we are going to calculate that degree. You know, how much is that? And that we can get from this Harrison's model of the band structure of the tight binding, which we're going to get a number for it. You know, so how much, you know. And what we'll see is something that you expect, that is you kind of climb up in the periodic table as you go to, uh, you know, from arsenic, uh, so let's go to the periodic table uh, here. So as you go from, say, arsenic to phosphorus to nitrogen, as you go up, the elements get more and more electronegative. They get more and more electronegative. Essentially, those atoms can pull electrons much stronger. Nitrogen can pull it much stronger than phosphorus can. Phosphorus is more stronger than arsenic. As a result, if you compare gallium arsenide and gallium nitride, gallium nitride is way more polar. You know, that bond is extremely more po much more polar than, than uh, gallium arsenide, for example. So those are the trends for compound semiconductors. As you go up in the periodic table, uh, and you can see why, because the you know, electron cloud, the empty shell, one electron is missing in the, uh, sorry, uh, so, so there, the nitrogen needs three more electrons to fill it, right? It's group five, so it needs three more electrons to fill its outermost shell. But the electron shell is much closer to the nucleus, right, because it has fewer electrons, right? And, and, and then, therefore, in, in, in chemistry and all, tell you in the end what, what, uh, uh, what we can intuitively say that this will be much more electronegative. So. Okay, so, uh, and, and then again, this is from Rocket's book. Uh, uh, this is something we had discussed in the last class. Now you see in a li little more vivid way. Uh, we, let's say we're looking at silicon, so you have the s orbital and then the 3p orbitals, s orbit so this is now the atoms of silicon, the nucleus is here, the next one is here, near is near. Uh, so, so this is the chemical bonding, and uh, uh, he's showing here, you know, the uh, orbital overlaps, so s and s overlap to give you e, you know, or what we are calling vss, sigma bonds and pi bonds and all that, and if you have p orbital and p orbital overlap, you know, uh, sideways, then you get EPP pi bonds. If they overlap, you know, this way, you get sigma bonds, and you have this cosine theta, sine theta factor. We discussed that in the last class. So, ba based on this, we are obviously calculating the entire band structure uh, by putting in these terms, these EPP, the hopping terms here, and the s orbital, p orbital energies into the gap. And then in the end result of that is you're going to get the band structure. And uh, so, so some common lattice parameters, uh, some lattice parameters and band gaps, and the conduction band edge and the valence band. Uh, so the the, con the conduction and the valence band edges 
from vacuum level, so vacuum level is zero, and then you go down four electron volts, you hit the conduction band of silicon. So if an electron is sitting in the conduction band minima of silicon, you need four electron volts to kick it out. You know? So that's called an electron affinity, right? So, so if you, uh, if, if your uh, band structure of a semiconductor would look like that, it's actually silicon is indirect, but if the, this is here, so remember electrons could be not in the crystal, they could be in vacuum, uh, but uh, you know, if, if, if they're in the crystal, they're filled up, the valence band is filled up, and the conduction band energies, these are allowed energies for the electron, and if somehow we have put an electron here in the conduction band, this is EC, EV, and this is the band gap, right? So those three quantities are, li are written there. This is the what's written as in, 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 in this column. So 4.05 EV for silicon would be kind of here. Gallium arsenide uh, would be about 4.07, very close, 4.07 electron volt below the vacuum level. So that's called the electron affinity. Q times chi, electron affinity. And, and in, in Device engineering, this is extremely important to know the electron affinities because that will determine band alignments and things like that, barrier heights and things like that, right? And uh, EV is obviously, uh, EV is the valence band edge and you can see from here that it is basically, you know, this plus band gap is equal to, you know, right? So, so, and you can check that there, uh, that, uh, you know, so 1.12 uh, plus 4.05, well, that's, okay, so. Uh, and uh, what you notice uh, also is, is so that there's, there's the elemental semiconductors, you know, diamond, band gap of 5.5 EV, silicon about 1.1, germanium 0.67. And what you realize right away is as you go, you know, down in the periodic table, the band gap shrink, gets smaller, right? 5.5 EV, 1.1 EV, 0.6 EV, and then this actually becomes a metal. The band gap shrink. So, so, and we're going to see that now a little bit. Uh, and then uh, uh, similarly, gallium. Uh, uh, so, so gallium nitride has 3.4 electron volts. Uh, you know, gallium. Uh, wait, do they have gallium phosphide here? Somehow they have not listed it. Okay, that's fine. So, gallium arsenide is 1.4 eV. So, so again, uh, let's look at compound semiconductors. Aluminum nitrogen. Aluminum nitride is a 3.5. Band gap is 6.2 electron volts. 6.2. Gallium nitride, 3.4 EV. Indium nitride, uh, 0.7 EV. Titanium nitride is a metal. Titanium nitride is a metal. So, so it shrinks by large amounts. And uh, the, the change of the band gaps is really the heart of the, the, uh, all the compound semiconductor heterostructure designs. So the change in the gaps. That's, you play with that in very nice ways too make lasers, LEDs, ultra-fast hems, and all that stuff. This change in the gaps. Okay, uh, okay. Uh, uh, so that's one trend. As you go down in periodic table, band gaps shrink. In fact, they go uh, negative in some sense, and big things become metals and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. There are, uh, uh, I think you also realize that there are situations where, well, we'll talk about things like semi-metals too. Uh, and again, in, in, in pictures, uh, uh, we, we the calculation you are doing is the tight binding model, uh, which uh, is, which will give you as many bands as uh, orbitals as you have chosen to start with, right? Uh, right? And uh, just as a uh, summary of what, uh, so, so since we started with, uh, um, you know, for gallium arsenide and silicon, we started with uh, uh, s orbital and p x, p y and PZ orbitals for both, you know, A atoms and B atoms, right? Both of them had the same. So we had eight, eight electrons. We, st we started with eight electrons, and we got our whole band structure, uh, which looked, you know, this. There were, and, and, and some higher bands here, so. Um, and and uh, what we had uh, actually, when you do this uh, diagonalization of uh, or that matrix calculation, what you will end up getting is is that uh, th at k is equal to zero, there are there's a degeneracy of two, meaning this has two bands. That's one band, 
that's one band. And I've asked you to kind of plot things between uh, some symmetry points from gamma, which is 0, 0, 0, to you know, L and X. The way I've plotted it here is, um, OK, so let me explain what I'm trying to do. There are two, two major points I want to make now. Which bands are filled, which bands are empty? That should be hopefully easy to calculate. Or, or, or figure out. Because you started with eight electrons, meaning 1s, 4p, four electrons from atom A, four electrons from atom B, so eight electrons. Right? Right. Now, eight electrons will go uh, uh, into how many bands? They will go into four bands. Because each band can hold two electrons. Each band can hold two. Oh, sorry, each state can hold two electrons. Each state each allowed state, meaning, what, what do I mean by that? I mean, here's an allowed state for e electrons. Here's an allowed state for electrons. Here's another. Here's another. These are all the allowed states. Right? At, if the electron is moving with this k, you know, it has a certain wavelength. If it is here, it's very long wavelength. If it's here, it's shorter wavelength. If it's here, it's atomic scale wavelength. At, at the band edges, its wavelength is very, very short. Right? So. If the electron is moving with this wavelength, you know, then it can have either this energy, or that energy, or that energy. It cannot have anything in between. That's the meaning of that's that's the restriction that quantum mechanics brings about. If it was classical mechanics, then things would be continuous in some sense. Right. So, so but uh, but uh, here, uh, uh, yeah. Let, so, so this is a uh, consequence of that. Uh, now, uh, here, uh, this band has. Uh, but then you know that we are not looking at one atom. We're looking at 10 to about 23 atoms or, or more than that, right? Right. So the number of atoms, what does that determine? It determines, uh, you know, actually if we look at this picture, it's not really continuous, but it's discrete. There are a number of states here. And each band, each band, for example, this is one band, has, if there are n atoms, there are n states in each band. The n state. Why? Uh, you can see, I mean, the total number of energy states allowed are going to be conserved. Right? You came in with one atom here. You know, this is combination of the two, if you might. And, and, then, uh, uh, and then you're repeating this over n, which n is very large. You know, it's a large crystal, 23 atoms or something like that, per centimeter cube typically. But, yeah, right? So each of them comes in with an energy state s and three p states. right? So if you have 10 to about 23 of those, then you have 10 to about 23. And, and, and what's happened is the S states of, you know, the deep S states have combined, for example, to give you this whole thing. And before chemical bonding, there were 10 to the power 23 degenerate states here. Do you see that? I and mean, they're all, all the same. You form the chemical bond, it's kind of spread out because, uh, because of interaction and hopping and all that. And then, but the total number of states has not changed. It's still 10 to the power 23. So that's preserved. That's the sum. So, so there are uh, that many states, and that is why uh, you know if you have n atoms, you have four n electrons, because uh, when I say atom, I really mean the basis. You know, it's a combination of the two, right? It's a molecule, if you want to think. That's what's repeated. So there are four n, uh, or you know, uh, 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 sorry, eight, because there are four four, and then then there are eight n repeats of it. So there are eight n electrons now, right? Eight n electrons. So basically what I'm saying is this band is going to take away 2n electrons because each state can hold up and down and there are n states. So 2 times n, it's two. each band can hold 2n electrons. And you have 8n electrons, therefore you'll fill one band, the second band. So this is one band. Right? And then there are actually two of these which are degenerate. So, they, they'll, so you get 4n, 2n plus 2n plus, you, know, you, end, end out, you run out of electrons by the time you reach here. No more electrons left, right? So those are the, 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 those are that are filled, and then above those, those are empty. So that's that's why we we are calling that as the conduction band. This is the top of the valence band, and that's your gap. Is that clear? I mean, this sometimes is. I, I think it's, if you have seen it, it's great. If not, you know, something sometimes forgotten. Yeah. All the top ones are the antibody, right? Sorry. All the top bands are the antibody. You can say that, yeah, the ones that are high energy. Uh, so what happens is, you know, that's a good point to s start thinking about it. Uh, uh, you're right. So you have the antibonding parts, and then that's why they are higher in energy, right? 
but w which orbital they came from, you have to be a little careful to track it down, you know, because, uh, uh, yeah. Uh, m so in direct band gap semiconductors, it's kind of a rule of thumb. Most of the times it will be correct that this came completely from, you know, the metal gallium S orbital. That's where it came from. Right? So in our tight binding model, remember, we, we did try to track down where did this state come from, and we realized that, uh, 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 so, so for example, uh, at k is equal to zero. At k is equal to zero, you, you realize that you know this term was four and everything else was zero, right? and therefore, you know uh, only the diagonal terms were non-zero. All the oft uh, meaning these terms were non-zero. So essentially, from here you could analytically calculate and say that well, the, uh, the, we found that that state for k is equal to zero state, you know this and this these two energy states came completely from s orbitals so so we can f track it down as to where it came from and all that so uh, and indeed these are anti bonding states uh, you are right uh, and uh, this is from the name so higher energy state will be the anti bonding state that's right yeah. uh, uh, the thing about the matrix is you can always go back and ask where did this energy you know what 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 is the composition of that eigen value what are the eigen states what uh, you know, if you're if you're using uh, some mathematical package that diagonalizes your matrices, it will, when it gives you an eigenvalue attached to each eigenvalue is eigenstate. What do I mean by that? Eigenstate will be composed of some coefficient c1 plus times this, c2 times this, c3 times this plus plus you know c4 times s of b. It'll uh, c5. So it'll give you all these coefficients, and you mod square that coefficient. That will tell you how much s, how much p, all this. So you can get it back completely. You decompose it. Yeah. So it's sometimes called project, project it to this orbital and things like that. Yeah. Uh, so I'm, uh, maybe sometime later I can ask you because you're doing it for the first time. If you set up your Hamiltonian, um, you can get all that info. Okay. So okay, uh, going back here, uh, looking at silicon band structure. This is really uh, another step beyond tight binding. Uh, this is uh, for, it was first figured out in mid 70s, I think, or late 70s. Uh, uh, slightly different way of calculating band structures, uh, uh, and you can. Uh, uh, right, I, I, I'll describe those things later, but uh, uh, you know, you, uh, and you can superimpose a tight binding picture on top of it, uh, and, and 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 see what, what how it looks. Essentially, when you go from gamma to k, uh, sorry, gamma to x, uh, you see these bands, right? And and uh, this band here, which is over there. Is is uh, doubly degenerate, so it has degeneracy of two. It's one on top of another, and uh, uh, these are uh, so silicon uh, looks like that. Uh, what I wanted to say, oh yeah, so that was one major point that each band can hold two uh, uh, n electrons. The other thing is, uh, you know, you see this is plotted from zero zero zero, and the way I've plotted it is it's asymmetric. You know, the way it's plotted here. E, e at plus k looks like it's minus. But actually, just realize that you know the the direction here from gamma to x is different from gamma to l. It's not the same. You know, it's just not not a reflection. Okay, it's very important. And so let me just say this: uh, unless otherwise, uh, uh, for for this part of the course, if you reflect something in k, uh, it will come back to its same energy so it will be mirror reflection always if you plot it along you know let's say this is uh, uh, x point which is 1 0 0 so the electron is going from 0, zero in, in the 1 0 0 direction and if on the left side I was plotting you know 1 bar or minus 1 0 0 or x bar then it will be a mirror reflection so electron moving this direction with certain momentum or backwards with with the same momentum will have the same energy and this is basically protected by symmetries of the crystal and sometimes i don't know uh, uh, so inversion so there are symmetries of inversion symmetry there is uh, time reversal symmetry and things like that uh, so y uh, you can break it in some crystals right and, and and but for these crystals we are we are we are we're not yet bro broken anything meaning for silicon for gallium arsenide graphene boron nitride everything we talked about till now this is true. If E is, you know, going, if you're going in one direction or the other, it's always the same. The reason why they look asymmetric here is because this is not this, you know, reflected direction. It's some other direction. It's just a way to represent in 2D plots 
something that's inherently three-dimensional, or, uh, uh, or you want to capture more information for graphene in k-space if you are going, you know, if the electron was going. So, you know, in, in k-space for graphene, uh, that would be k, that would be k prime, and that's m. So when you plot from gamma to k, you know, uh, you're, you're, you have one slice of the band. You, then, then sometimes uh, the other, other side of the band is from here to there. So there are two different directions in case with different momenta. That's just an important point. And, and we'll see later that you can actually change this uh, in very interesting ways. Uh, when you have spin and when you have magnetic fields and all that, you can break time reversal symmetry in ways, and that's when you get into all these you know, uh, topological insulator states where if it's going in one direction, you can have only one spin. You know, up, or if it's going the other way, it's a down spin. And like that. So, so. But, but this is uh, 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 something very important for this part of the course. Okay? And uh, what you notice here is both band structures look very similar. Very similar. Except for points of high symmetry, except for what happens gamma point. You look at silicon, uh, uh, you see, so we go gamma to x. Uh, for example, you look at these bands, they touch each, I mean, they, they, they intersect here. If you were to zoom in, you know, this would, you know, in 3D or something, it would look something like a Dirac cone, something like it, but not exactly, it's 3D. But unfortunately, you can't access that very easily because the bands are filled all the way till here. So this is buried deep inside, and when you do transport measurements and all that sort of thing, you don't see this point. You see only what, what's at the top, floating on the top. It's like traffic on the ocean. You see what's going on inside. At least, I mean, well, there's a lot of traffic going on down you know, inside too, but yeah, I think you know what I mean here, so yeah. Okay, so, uh, uh, and, and so there are all kinds of interesting points. Uh, in the band structure, but uh, for electronic photonic applications, the most one, you know, important ones are here because this is typically inaccessible. What does that mean? It means you can kick it out. You can kick an electron out of here. It will take you quite a bit of energy, but you know, all this stuff will just fill it again. And, and if you kick an electron out of this state, all the electrons at the high energies will fill it, and therefore that empty state will bubble up to the top. Right? And that's called a hole. Right? So it's, just, it's always going to go to the top. And then within Typically, within uh, you know a certain number of uh, picoseconds, if you had created an empty state here, that empty state would be there. This would be filled because it's you know. The, uh, so do you see? I mean, there's uh, all these electrons that have a low energy to go to, you scatter, and the hole bubbles up. So it, it's a very fast process, and uh, therefore uh, the holes. If you put extra, if you take away electrons, you will end up with empty states here. If you put electrons, you'll end up with empty states there and so on, uh, with filled states there. So that's conduction band edge and valence band edges are the most important. If you go in silicon, for example, uh, to X point, uh, you see they touch. And remember, for graphene also, if we looked at the band structure here, you're doing the assignment problem, uh, you know, you, you get a, the bands touch, right, at the K point. In graphene, because of SP2, uh, SP2 bonding and all, these states are occupied, right? These states were occupied, and these states are empty by electron counting again. How many, you know, when do you run out of electrons for graphene? You run out exactly here. Right? You go from graphene, uh, so this is the K point band structure, E versus K. And we went to boron nitride, and we saw that it's basically the same deal, except you have a huge gap here. Because, why? Because the on site energies are different. Right? Right? That's what you saw, yeah. Now, exactly the same business is going on here if you go from, say, silicon, or let's look at germanium. You know, germanium is here. You see the bands kind of touch here. And you go to gallium arsenide, this one splits. Same, same deal. You have broken inversion, inversion symmetry, meaning uh, you know, a compound semiconductor intrinsically ha lacks uh, you know, a certain degree of inversion symmetry here, meaning if you have gallium and arsenic, you know, you're going from gallium to arsenic. Uh, you know, it's, it's basically it's not the, the two atoms are different, right? If you have a mirror plane in between and you reflect, it's not the same. It's not you know not as opposed to silicon or germanium where both atoms are the same. So that splitting, for example, X point splitting, you can explain very easily by looking at <coughs> uh, your matrix elements, because at X point your K is like one zero zero. You, know, you plug those in, and you realize that for silicon. Certain terms will be, you know, this this uh, this term here, 
the eigenvalues here uh, for silicon and germanium will be the same. You'll get a double degenerate here, it'll split. It makes sense? So that is, that, that's exactly similar picture as here. The difference is here, all the business is happening, all the electronic photonic problems are happening because your Fermi level is right here, right? At the point of where it's splitting. But here, the, the Fermi level is way above, you know, so, so you don't quite see it easily. That part of it. Uh, now, as you get more and more accurate, uh, I'm just going to uh, speed up this uh, just to summarize a little part. So, uh, uh, the real structure obviously has far more electrons, and here's a picture. Again, this is from Rocket. Please read up chapter 5. It's, I think, written very nicely. Uh, uh, the real picture, he, what's shown here are these contours of a mod psi square of electrons. You know? so, so, it is a more accurate calculation in space. Uh, and and uh, uh, so, these are the densities, the co contours of equal density of electrons. How many electrons? So if the contours are closer to each other, you have more electrons. If they're spread farther apart, you have less electrons. Makes sense? Less probability of finding them. And so, uh, and then is what it's showing is, you know, the chemical bond. So between two atoms here and here, you have a lot more bunching, and so the electron density is higher. And, and so that's what you call a chemical bond. So, so And then, you know, from here to there, and so on. And uh, as you increase the lattice constants, you know, they change in a certain way. Uh, most features look similar, you know. So, so a chemical bond, uh, the, the uh, uh, you know, the valence bonds are typically the bonding orbitals, which peaks at the middle, right? The bonding and the antibonding. The bonding orbital will have, you know, this plus this, so it will kind of peak at the middle. The antibonding ones will be a node in the middle, right? right so, so, and so on. So you can kind of see those pictures. All the, chemi the these are bonding orbital pictures, and they peak in the middle of the two two, two atoms. Yeah. Okay. So uh, that's uh, about the uh, uh, little, maybe a little more discussion. As I said, I mean, two very important points were not just. It's not enough to just calculate the band structure, but to identify wh where is you know which bands are filled and which are empty. That's obviously extremely important. Symmetries are very important. If you're going from gamma to x and gamma to minus x, they should have exactly the same energy. So you mir mirror reflect it. But if you're going gamma to x and here you're going to gamma to l or some other point, they are not you know they need not be the same. Right? There's no need for them to be the same. They're different crystal orientations, right? So whenever you see these diagrams plotted, typically they're always plotted like this because you're plotting 3D slices into into 2D space. Right? So, okay. Uh, now, uh, what what I wanted to uh, uh, do next is just one more thing uh, before we talk a little bit about experiments and move over to compounds in in more detail. So if I have a band structure like this. <coughs> Uh, I want to explain this from a more basic picture again. Uh, what we're going to, uh, from the band structure, one of the most important things we get out of it is, is, is uh, what you are going to call the density of states. Density of states. Uh, so density of states, uh, for, uh, you can define it loosely for an atom, silicon atom, for example. You have a s orbital. And you have three p orbitals, right? And you can ask, well, what's the density of state of an atom? The density of states of an atom is what is is the following. So uh, you plot energy in this axis, and now the density of states you can call it g of e. It's a function of the energy. And uh, uh, what does density of state? Roughly speaking, when I integrate the density of states over energy. I should get the number of states you have. That, that's the meaning of density of states. Right. Or in other words, the density of states is basically something like, you know, how many states do you have per unit slice of energy? R Actually, not roughly. This is it. This is really the meaning of density of states. How many states do you have per, per unit slice of energy? Okay. So for an atom like this, well, what is my density of states? Well, if I am here in energy, I have no states, no states, and I certainly cross it, I have one state, right? You see that? So I have a step function change, right, in, 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 in this picture, right? But uh, 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 so, so I can kind of calculate right here what is my n as a function of e, right? Uh, so, and n would be, it's not the number here, but it's a function, we can write it like n of e. 
So I have nothing, nothing, and then I go here, I suddenly have one and nothing, and then uh, I, have, I keep getting one, and then I have, does it make sense? So I have one, I add one here, and I add three here, so I get to four, right? Does it make sense? So what is density of states? It's a derivative of this. It's a derivative of that. So a derivative of this is basically it's a unit step function. A step function has a derivative of a, like a Dirac delta function. Right? It's, it's a very sharply peaked function, right? So, and then you have another Dirac delta, but it's like three times stronger function than this one. Right? So that that is your density of states of the atom. Okay. Now, obviously, we are uh, not interested so much in the atom right now, but in the crystal. And I think you already know what happened in the crystal. You know, this thing kind of, um, you put up, put, you, 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 you let 10 to the power 23 of those, three, you know, form a chemical bond and form a lattice, right, in the crystal. And therefore, you have 10 to the power 23 of those and about 23 of each one of them now. Right? And they have expanded out into bands now, right? And you have a band structure. This is what has happened now. Right? Now the question is, what is the density of states for this? How has that changed? Right? I mean, that's really the question. And I think you can, uh, again, uh, go through a similar picture here. What you do numerically, what you do is, is uh, uh, you know, again. So, okay. So you can again calculate what I was calling as like the, how many electrons do I have, and then you calculate its derivative to get this. Right? You can do that. Actually. But here you have to be a little careful for 3D, 3D crystals, right? Because don't get fooled, this is really just one of the slices, okay? And this is one of the slices. So essentially what I'm saying is, one thing I, I know for sure is, for example, I will get, you know, um, I, I, let, let me just sketch it, okay? Let me just uh, sketch this. I'll get some, some, something here which will start from nothing and then it'll kind of go up, right? And as you go through this, bands here, right? you'll, you'll get you know, uh, quite a bit and then it'll kind of, I don't know, it'll look something like that. Actually, no, I'm going to always sum, right? So, so what am I doing? The density is going to look. So it's kind of, kind of increase, increase, and then when I hit a gap, it's going to become flat. There's, we're not adding anymore, right? Then I hit another band, right? Then I hit another gap, it's going to be flat, right? another band, right? So that's how it's going to look now. What has happened really is these things have just broadened out. Broadened out, broadened out. So, so, yeah. And then you take a derivative. When you take the derivative, what will happen is you'll get these, you know, something. Um, this is obviously very rough what I'm sketching here, but uh, uh, it has quite a bit more structure, and I'll probably show you some, you know, it can have some structures like that. Yeah. And then, again, conduction band will look like that. So this, these are the allowed, you know, bands, and this is your density of states. This makes sense. At least qualitatively, it's clear. Quantitatively, how would you do it, right? Quantitatively, if you get your tight binding structure, it needs a little bit of work, but what you need to do is, uh, you know, this is, uh, remember you have to sum, you know, for each energy, there are kx, ky, and kz. There are three, you know, your k space is three dimensional for a 3D crystal. So you go in and you kind of discretize your k space, kx. Ky and Kz, you know, you have your gamma point, which is zero, zero, zero. So essentially, what you have is numerically, you can kind of discretize it into very small number of chunks. And if you know your crystal is, you know, diamond cubic or zinc bland, you know the billion zone. You know what's the minimum set of k points you need. But then, you actually don't need to find in all of k. what you then have to do is say, well, here's my energy. I'm going to give you an energy window of this much. Find how many, you know, uh, so, so I, I can kind of uh, say, so, so the energy window will be kind of a slice, and you want to find how many dots, these points, fall inside that slice. That's the number you are after. And typically, if your billion zone is like, a, you know, what we had sketched, the face center cubic uh, uh, billion zone, uh, uh, you can use, that's where you can use symmetry very cleverly to reduce the zones where you want it. You don't, as you can see, it has a lot of symmetries, and you have like a little wedge somewhere, which is the minimal set here. You identify the minimal set, count how many there are, and then multiply it by 16 or whatever, you know, how many times it's reflected around. 
And you just count the number of states that fall inside there within that energy window. And then that's how you will get this N of E. Does that make sense? I mean, qualitatively at least. And then maybe I can ask you and give you an example to do it later. And then you, you know, find this and you take its uh, uh, derivative to get the density of states. Mm -hmm. well, one of the very interesting features of the density of states is uh, obviously, I mean, it's actually, uh, uh, let me put it this way, pretty much all properties of the semiconductor or, the, or, or any, any material can be derived from here. Dielectric constant, optical absorption coefficients, you know, um, uh, band gap, uh, well, band gap obviously, but a lot of, lot of thermal, thermal properties, you know, and, and so on can be derived from the density of states. And density of states can be measured by STM and, and all these other things as well. I mean, there are many, many ways to measure it. Uh, uh, some of the uh, interesting features of the density of states uh, are the following. So, uh, I mean, this is obviously a very rough picture, but uh, what you'll see is, is uh, you know, it, it, it will have sometimes this very sharp features uh, let me let me maybe draw it like that so you may have a feature that may like look like that like a little peak here okay. and the peaks are typically always when there is you are hitting another band you know these are special so you have another band that, that just started you know and you suddenly have a lot of states so these are uh, uh, so that, that that's what it's going to look like uh, your peaks and these peaks show very clearly in optical measurements very clearly. These are singularities, uh, endpoints. I mean, these are all this is when you do a reflectivity or transmission measurement, it'll show up very clearly. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, when I talk about photonic properties later, uh, I'm going to uh, show that uh, the absorption coefficient that you measure, we started with in the course, the absorption coefficient that you measure for a semiconductor. If this is the valence band density of states, and that is, you know, you have some shape here, the conduction band density of states, right? If, if, if you know the two density of states, right? Let me turn it around and plot it like this. So let's say this is my, and I just sketched it somewhere. Again, this is rough, obviously, but uh, this is my valence band density of states, which is filled. And here's my conduction band density of states. Typically, it will be a little lower, but I'm just sketching it this way. It's my conduction band density of states. This is the shape of the two density of states. The absorption coefficient, what we'll show, looks like this. It is actually uh, it is what is called mathematically as a convolution of the two density of states. It's a convolution. Physically, what's going on is when you have shine light, these states are filled and you have photons and that photon has this much energy and it can kick it here. If it has this much energy, it can't. Does that make sense? So, so, the, right, so if an electron starts, so this is energy scale and uh, if a photon has enough energy to kick it there, it will. If it cannot, then it won't. Well, uh, and then, uh, uh, so that feature, and then you change the photon energy, right? You're changing. And so you see, you know, you have a point here and you have a point there. You have these slices, the heights of these are multiplied and, and the absorption coefficient really is a, is a convolution of the two. And so if you take, for example, if you take a function like that and a function like that, and you convolute the two, you will end up with something like that. You can do these little exercises when we talk about it, but that's really the picture. So that's why. So as a result, when you do the absorption spectra, you can, for example, if you know one and you change this h bar omega, you can extract the other. So, so that's the trick people use to extract the density of states of so optical. Okay. So uh, so uh, uh, I will uh, this density of states again. It was qualitative at this point, uh, and and. Uh, um, I will actually ask you at some point to maybe look at it because you have your once you have your tight binding Hamiltonian or sorry matrix you can program it to give you the density of states and, and I think it would be a nice exercise to do it. At some point. Yeah. All right, so uh, here's uh, 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 I'm, I'm going to start talking a little bit about uh, compound semiconductors uh, uh, now, but uh, here's here's one of the uh, actually just give me one one more minute. Uh, yeah, so, so uh, just as a pictures again, gamma, uh, we already talked about it. For silicon, we have you know, degeneracy and 
this why this point splits is something you can explain easily. Um, uh, if you remember, uh, the first part of the, actually the second chapter of Rocket has a discussion of the free electrons, right? free electron quantum mechanical model. And uh, what you see is uh, if you calculate just the free electron energies of a crystal, and you calculate your tight binding or you know full blown band structure, most of the parts except for these degeneracy points remain pretty much similar. This band remains like that. What the, why is that? Because the electrons, if their wavelengths are not matched with the crystal lattice constant, they don't see the crystal at all. They're moving through the whole forest of atoms as if there are no atoms. Right? I think you know this very well. You know, if you take a grating uh, and you shine a wavelength of laser or light through it, which is completely unmatched, the laser will just go through. There will be no diffraction, no interference, none of that. Right? It doesn't see it. But the moment the electron wavelength becomes similar to the lattice constants, you know, uh, uh, G or you know, all that, those, that's when you get a lot of interaction and you form basically standing waves. The electrons cannot propagate anymore because they are diffracted very strongly. And that's when you open the band gaps and all that. You know, all these perturbations happen when, uh, when, when the electron wavelengths become similar to the lattice constants. And, and that's the other way to look at it. We ha I haven't emphasized that picture too much. Uh, I've emphasized the atomic picture a little bit more, right? But there are two different ways of this, looking at the same thing, this, coming at it from different angles. So if you are interested in what's going on far away from the band edges, the free electron model is actually very accurate. In fact, I mean, it's amazingly accurate. You can see these are free electron models, and you see, you know, these bands uh, pretty much are unperturbed. So uh, that's another point I wanted to make uh, before we get into uh, these details. Okay. Experimentally, how do you measure it? Uh, here's a, uh, a technique. So uh, here's a semiconductor crystal, say gallium arsenide. You clip the gallium arsenide, and you shoot photons at it. Right? And then uh, uh, what, what happens electronically is the photon goes in, maybe it, it is matched with this electron, uh, you know, with symmetry, whatever symmetries and all allow it, and then that electron is kicked out. Here's the vacuum level, it's kicked out at, with some extra energy. Because that photon was maybe 10 EV, and this vacuum to that energy was maybe 8 EV, so you have 2 EV more. Not only that, you know, this interaction, even the photons have very little momentum. Right. So they go in with almost k is equal to zero. Their, their wavelengths are much longer than, you know, electrons have wavelengths of angstroms, you know, a few angstroms here, right? Uh, in the, so so, so you know, photons are hundreds of nanometers. You know, green is 500 nanometer, for example, 530. Uh, and, and, and therefore, the electron momentum, photon momentum is, too, is very little, but photon has a lot of energy, right? Uh, and and, and uh, so it kicks it out, but it doesn't change the k too much. Does that make sense? In that interaction, momentum is conserved. So the electron that comes out really doesn't change its momentum too much. It's kind of similar to what it was, but its energy has been changed by h bar omega. Right? Now, if you can detect what is its momentum, and you know exactly what is your photon energy, you typically know, uh, you know how much kinetic energy it came out, then you immediately got that point, E and its k, both. If you can detect which k it's going, which angle is it going in. Right? So this measure is called an angle resolved photoelectron spectroscopy. Photoelectrons. Photo photons go and kick out electrons. Right? And you resolve the angle at which it's coming out. Right? So it's called ARPES, angle resolved photoelectron spectroscopy. And so what you can do is either take the semiconductor, and, and so basically the whole trick is you can design the experiment so when the electron is being shot out, you've got to detect which angle it's coming in and what k it's coming in. Right? And, and so I'm not going to get into the details here, but either you can rotate the crystal and change these k's, or you can you know, keep the crystal fixed and you can have a, like a whole range, I mean like a whole thing, and you can kind of spectrally resolve where you know, the electrons are landing and have the angles that way. So this system is set up in Duffield Hall and Professor Kyle Shen's group, and uh, I think uh, many of, some of you have probably used it already. To image this, you can image this entire EK, EK diagram. Obviously, here you realize that you have to have an electron here to kick it out, right? If you don't have an electron, you can't kick it out, right? So it's much more difficult to image typically conduction bands than the valence bands because valence bands are filled, so it's pretty easy to image them, right? 
So, uh, uh, so, so, uh, so, and then obviously you're changing the photon energy, so you're scanning this whole range. Here's a picture for gallium arsenide. You know, we, we, from tight binding, you can calculate these band structures, and these dots are the experimentally measured ones. Uh, so this is UV photo. So you can do what's called an inverse photoelectron spectra to do this sort of thing, where you kind of reverse the process. You know, where you let uh, you can think of it. So you kind of bring in an electron and see if it transitions and emits a photon. What what fo was that energy of the photon, for example? So you can go through to image the conduction band. Conduction bands are typically harder. Right? So currently, this technique has been used heavily to image all these you know Dirac cones and all this kind of fun, fun stuff. So, yeah. So the angle allows you to determine the momentum? Yes, the k. Yeah. That's right. So, so the angle of the k. Uh, but I, I think you know that k, um, yeah, you can, maybe uh, if, if you're asking, uh, um, so the energy is very clear, you know, uh, yeah. because you can take that. And the angle will give you the k. What it will give you is basically you know exactly what angle you're coming in with. Yeah. And what angle you, you can spectrally move this, for example, or rotate the crystal. And the k in minus k out, you can control that. You know? So uh, as a result, you can, from there, backtrack what k did the electron start with. You know? so, so, and then you know it's k. So you can map out the entire k space this way. So when they do the measurements in Duffy Lol, if you, uh, you know, uh, maybe I can show you a picture in the next class, they actually will scan different points of k planes. You, know? you can do the, you can scan through a k space point where it's at zero or, you know, some other x direction, l direction, and that, that's how it's measured. And so that's, just, and, but yeah, that assumes that it doesn't change the momentum, right? The, the photon. The photon momentum is very negligible compared to the electron. Compared to the electron, but you know you can include it. You yeah. can do the full momentum conservation. Photon coming in plus electron was already sitting there is equal to the momentum of electron coming out, and no photon. So you can do that as well. And then I think the modeling, uh, the theory that goes behind, you know. Getting those points includes those things. It does include those things. Yeah. So, um, so, so when you when electron in one of the bands, it doesn't have a well-defined momentum. Right? It has a well-defined crystal momentum. Correct. Right? Um, That's right. So, which does it come out with when you? Because the photon doesn't change its real momentum. Right? Oh, that's right. Yeah. So uh, let's let, let, let me uh, say that uh, the. Uh, that's a very good question. So, you know, if you have a, unless you have a free electron, right, a free electron has a well-defined momentum. Right? So, so that can have a well-defined wavelength and a well-defined momentum. It's only when you are in the edges here that you are heavily perturbed. And these states are composed of several momenta, right? I mean, it is composed of overlaps of various orbitals and all that sort of thing. So, um, because of this, uh, I think there's always issues of, you know, wh wh what exactly is the momentum of that electron that's coming out if you're near the band edge. And uh, so there's broadening. In fact, you can measure that broadening. Is, that's the interesting thing. As you go, if you have very narrow gap material, there's quite a bit of mixing at the band edges. And when you measure it multiple times, you will get a delta of energy for the same k angle. So that's a broadening. And you can measure that, too. So there are all these things that, go on. but that's a good question, actually. Yeah, but uh, whenever you are in in between where the free electron rules, it's clear. Right? When you are near the edges where it's mixing, there will be some broadening, and you extract it in experiment. Uh, okay. So so uh, let's. Uh, uh, one more thing uh, about the bands uh, before we start discussing the compound semiconductors in some more detail. Uh, at the valence band edge. The edge of the valence band, you know, typically what you'll see is uh, you will have a degeneracy of two and another band which will look, you know, like that. So degeneracy of three at k is equal to zero if you don't put in spin. And uh, there are two bands. One of them is very less, like, slow, you know, uh, curved less. The other is curved a lot more. Uh, this is what's called the light hole band and this is called the heavy hole band. And uh, when you track back uh, from your tight binding model, I might ask you to look at it uh, in your assignment. Uh, uh, so you can track back, say, well, give me the states, orbital states, of which these are composed of, you know, light hole and heavy hole. What you will find is the heavy holes are composed 
of orbital overlaps that are, these are primarily p orbitals, right? So p, z, p, z. The heavy holes would be composed of something like this, and the light holes would be composed of, you know, so heavy holes would be like v, p, p, pi bonds, and the light holes would be composed typically of v, p, p, sigma bonds. And I think pictorially you can see why it's easier or for electrons to move this way than this way. Maybe, I don't know, I mean, and you'll see these numbers are accordingly, uh, uh, you know, different, uh, and, and uh, uh, so, so, okay, so, so there's that connection pictorially as well. So, so to see. one more point I wanted to just mention before I move forward here. Okay. So, uh, when you calculate uh, your, your eigenvalues, you can kind of backtrack this and say, wh what are the orbitals, and tell me light hole composition, heavy hole composition, and all that, let's catch that. Okay, so now uh, we're going to discuss a little bit about uh, the, some particular compound semiconductors. <coughs> and uh, uh, what I'm going to start with today and uh, uh, you know, continue a little more discussion in the next class uh, is, uh, uh, so, so we have uh, gallium arsenide. You know, it has a lattice constant of 5.65 uh, angstrom. And when I say 5.65 angstrom, that is the, not the nearest neighbor distance. I think that was my a little bit of a problem with the assignment problem. I this. So this is not the nearest neighbor distance. It's kind of the whole uh, uh, distance between, uh, you know, what's kind of the conventional unit cell, not the primitive cell, but, uh, you know, gallium and arsenic. So A is this, 5.65 is this end. So if you calculate what's the distance between the nearest neighbors, it will be like square root of three by four times A. So the body centered cubic, uh, sorry, no, I mean, basically you take the diagonal and then you calculate this distance, that will be like square root of three by four times this lattice constant A. So that's 5.6 angstrom roughly. And for most uh, semiconductors, uh, what you'll notice the trend is, is, is uh, what I want to you know, end up discussing, uh, end cla the class we're discussing is as the gaps uh, as the lattice constants get larger, the band gaps grow smaller. This is a general trend. R longer lattice constant, meaning atoms are farther up apart. Okay. And, uh, uh, and the chemical bonding, you're basically, uh, uh, your nearest neighbors are farther apart. Okay. And uh, the hopping terms are different, the you know, hopping terms uh, change and all that. And you can kind of, from the tight binding model, already explain why this is the case, why this should be the case, the trend. Larger lattice constant will lead to smaller band gaps. Uh, and uh, uh, so let's look at just gallium-based material. Uh, gallium phosphide is, band gap is about 2.3 you know, electron volts. Now these are, each of them is very, uh, technical, technologically extremely important. Gallium phosphide is at the heart of, uh, uh, gallium phosphide happens to be actually an indirect band gap semiconductor, meaning the minimum of K conduction band is not at the maximum of the valence band. It's one of those, uh, you know, uh, okay, so gallium phosphide, these dashed lines are ones that are showing indirect band gap. The solid lines are showing direct band gap. Gallium arsenide is a direct gap material. The maxima of valence band is exactly the same point as the minima of the conduction band, the gallium arsenide. Uh, gallium phosphide is indirect, but w later on what we'll see is if you replace some of the phosphorus with nitrogen atoms, very lightly, I mean not, not all, uh, if you replace all of them, you become gallium nitride. So that's a direct band. But if you replace uh, only a few phosphorus atoms with nitrogen, it becomes direct gap. We're going to see that, and it's very interesting. That's actually not, uh, it's very useful because pretty much all red, most red LEDs you buy are based on that idea, that you start with indirect gallium phosphide, but you put in a little bit of nitrogen and it becomes direct and it emits really bright red color. So it's a red LED. You can make red, uh, so for the high-end red LEDs that are in the back tails of cars today are using, uh, some of them use uh, more fancier quantum wells and all that are also made of three fives. But gallium phosphide, you can grow gallium phosphide in, in basically from melt directly, large volumes. And you can put in a little bit of nitrogen in there during the growth. It's much easier to do that than growing these quantum wells and all that. So, so therefore, for high volume, 
not extremely high efficiency LEDs, this is still heavily used today. So in fact, uh, if you have any old equipment that have red LEDs, they're typically all gallium phosphide based LEDs. So yeah. All right. So uh, and and uh, I think you 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 know. So red is about. You can see red is about what. Uh, red color is about 1.8, 1.9 EV, right? And so you, you need to go gallium phosphide, and when you add nitrogen, the band gap shrinks to about 1.8 or 1.9 EV. That's when you get red light. Now you go to gallium arsenide. Uh, 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 this direct band gap, uh, and, and uh, uh, band gap is about 1.4 electron volts. So 1.4, you notice, well, I don't know whether it's easy to see here, but 1.4 starts getting from red to infrared infrared, right? So this is a longer wavelength. Uh, gallium arsenide, so, uh, and then uh, we look at indium arsenide is roughly point, you know, 0 0.3 electron volt band gap, very small band gap, indium arsenide. As the band gaps get smaller, what we'll see is the bands themselves, for example, you look at silicon, uh, you know, bands, uh, well, it, I think it's not shown very clearly here, but as the band gaps get smaller, what happens is this band, you know, it's curved in a certain way. If it's a smaller band gap material, it will curve even sharper. Curve even sharper, right? And then the gaps go smaller. And the curvature here is what you call as the effective mass of the electron. It's related to the effective mass. As a result, if the mass, if the electron feels it's lighter, it can have much higher mobility. In the electron. So, so smaller band gaps as you go down. Gallium arsenide, room temperature mobility, 8,000, 9,000 centimeter square per volt second. Indium arsenide, 15,000, 15 or maybe even higher. You go even lower, indium antimonide, that's like 40,000 centimeter square per volt second. Very high mobility. But the band gap is also small. So, 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 and, and I think you. Kind of roughly along that trend, if you go to graphene, the mobility is higher, but the gap is zero now. So, so in some sense, along that trend, but a little different. Yeah. So uh, again, so that's another trend. Gal uh, lattice constant is larger, but uh, the, the band gap is smaller. Transport is better. Electrons move faster. Holes will also move faster in those yeah. uh, Similarly, gallium nitride uh, is 3.4 electron volt band gap. The reason it's plotted in a separate graph is because these are all zinc blend crystal structure, right? Zinc blend. This, the, the, you can have cubic, but it's cubic is metastable. Uh, hexagonal or the wartzite structure is the stable phase for gallium nitride, three fives, uh, which is why it's plotted in a separate plot. Uh, and uh, uh, now uh, the fact that we have these bulk materials is obviously extremely important, but what is extremely even more important in three fives, and this is where we can end the class today, is, uh, sorry for, you know, so you can actually, as you can see, here you have gallium arsenide, here you have aluminum arsenide. They are almost the same lattice constant, almost the same. Which means if you deposit aluminum arsenide on top of gallium arsenide, the lattice constants are almost the same. And they can grow almost perfectly on top of each other. There'll be no strain, no defects, and that sort of thing. Similarly, you go to indium phosphide. You know, you can grow something in between. So all these lines in between are alloys, and we're going to discuss this in the next class in detail. Alloys mean if I take gallium arsenide, add, take out 10% of gallium atoms, put in indium, I get indium gallium arsenide. It's an alloy. Now it has a band gap. You can see you can now control completely the band gap. Yeah. What you want, grow that material, you get that band gap. You know, a lattice constant as well. So you can completely control these, and that's the idea. So, so for example, if you want to grow completely lattice matched, you go up and down and see what are the other materials available. If I, I, if I choose aluminum arsenide right on top of it, or I choose indium gallium phosphide, indium phosphide, gallium phosphide, and alloy of that, I can choose that composition of indium and gallium and grow it on gallium arsenide and grow as much as I want. There's no strain, it's lattice matched. Look at gallium nitride, you go up there, you have indium, so you have aluminum nitride here, indium nitride. I have indium aluminum nitride at a certain composition that is exactly lattice matched to gallium nitride. You grow that, you get a larger band gap, no strain. So that is the idea of heterostructures. You have different band gap materials right on top of each other with no strain, almost perfect. You know? And that's at the heart of most lasers and LEDs and good transistors today. So that's, uh, if, you, if you get to that point, uh, you can have a whole range of band structures. We're going to stop here today. 
But I think if you just get this point, then most of tricks of compound semiconductors is to play with this now. You know, you say, well, I'm going to design this, I'm going to design that, I want this much band offset, I want this band gap, I want red light from here, I want green light from there. You just choose from here. I want this band gap, I grow that layer. I want that band gap, I grow that layer. Now, that, okay? Okay, so we end, end that here. Again, today was again somewhat qualitative, uh, but uh, uh, we'll, I want to proceed this way. We'll first start with some qualitative pictures and then make it quantitative. Okay? Uh, and uh, we don't have a class on Monday because it's, uh, I think, break, and so we meet on Thursday. And uh, uh, okay, so that, that's all. Thanks. <clears throat>